verse 19. This is a very familiar passage of scripture. We included it in a bulletin at one season, and I just want to uh, obey the Holy Spirit as we lead, uh, as he leads us today into what we're going to be talking about. It says, Behold, I will do a new thing. Someone say, New thing. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness. Someone shout, way in the wilderness. I'll make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So this morning, we're going to be talking about a message, the subject of out of the wilderness. Out of the wilderness. This is fascinating because there's some things that we're going to learn about the wilderness. Take your neighbor by the hand as a point of a contact and a sign of unity. And let's invade God's uh, presence and ask him again to bless and anoint this message. Father, we love you. And we're so thankful for this privilege one more time to stand behind this holy desk, this sacred desk, and to preach your word. We ask that your word will go forth in power and in demonstration of spirit, a powerful seed planted in good ground to bring forth much fruit. Holy Spirit, I know you're in this, in this room. We have felt your presence. Continue to lead and guide and direct us, comfort us. Bring all things back to our remembrance. Whatsoever has been spoken, whatsoever has been written, bring us insight for our eyesight. Open our ears that we may hear what you are saying to the church. And Father, we pray, confirm this word with signs and wonders. Manifest your presence in such an amazing way. And when we leave this room, we will bear much fruit and continue to operate in your gifts. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody says, amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to ask you a question, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I'll get some positive feedback from this. But has anyone in this auditorium ever had a wilderness experience? Anybody? Just raise your hand if you ever had a wilderness experience. It's kind of funny because Wednesday night I was, I was kind of sharing a little bit with our Wednesday night crowd. And I was saying... You know, how many of you have ever had a wilderness experience and all these young people started raising their hand? And I said, wait a minute. I said, uh, what I mean, I'm spiritually speaking here. I'm not talking about have you ever been out in the forest, you know, looking for a deer or something. But you ever had a wilderness experience? And um, you know, sometimes young people don't, can't grasp that concept. Some can, but some aren't able to. But uh, when you think about the wilderness, you know, when you hear the, even the term as a believer, if you've been saved for a while, you've been walking with God for a while, when you begin to hear the term wilderness, you get a little, I, I don't know about you, but I get a little nervous because I know what happens in the wilderness. I know what goes on when you're in that spiritual wilderness, the season of your life. And one of the greatest books, I believe, outside of the Bible, obviously, is uh, a book uh, that talks about a journey that this lady took, and it's called Hind's Feet in High Places. Anybody ever read that classic book? And it's such a classic, and it speaks upon a journey uh, that she had and how God, you know, took care of her. There's a lot of levels you can learn, even grasp from that particular novel. But um, when you begin to talk about the wilderness, you got to understand that God is the creator of all things. I mean, everything. He has created everything, and so it, it is our, our it is a characteristic for our creator to lead us to have a wilderness experience. It's not that we're he's mad at us. He's not that he's he doesn't want us, you know, to succeed or prosper. It's none of that is, is the reason. Because you have to understand, the God, you know, the old song used to say he, he's God, you know, on the mountain. He's God in a valley. He's with us wherever we go. He's still God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. How many believe that to be true? And so when you think of this wilderness experience, isolation and barrenness may be a need at a particular season in your life. Really, it may be. Barrenness, isolation, there may be a reason that God allows that to take place in your life. And so one of the things that when we begin to look at this subject of the wilderness, out of the wilderness is the title of this message. But when we look at the subject of the wilderness, we spend, as a believer, we spend a lot of question and we ask ourselves when we're in the wilderness, we ask ourselves, why? What have I gotten myself into? Why am I in the wilderness? And that's all we see. We see our surroundings. We see our barrenness. We see our isolation. We see times of testing. Why am I in the wilderness? And that has become our question. But you know what? We should be questioning this. What have we gotten ourselves from? Because, see, that's, that's the dynamic that we don't think of. 
We think of, well, where am I right now? That's how we are. We're such a present person. I mean, we're just thinking about right now and the reality that we're in. But we never really stop and consider, what am I getting from? Why, what am I escaping from? Why, why has God led me into the wilderness from? But the urbanization of something outside of the wilderness is affecting me, is possibly, you know, shaping maybe some beliefs, maybe some theology, and I need to get away from that, and God is leading me into the wilderness. And so maybe that's something we need to question. What is it about the wilderness uh, that, that, we, that God favors? In my life right now, in the season of my life. And I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you're facing. Um, but that's a good question. What is favorable about the wilderness to God? Why did God even create it? What is so favorable to him? You know, in the subject of this wilderness, when we begin to look at this subject, all we think of that it's alluding to a time of testing or a time of purging. That's why you're in the wilderness. It's because God is testing you. You're in the wilderness because God is purging you. You've heard me say before, you don't know what kind of fruit you have until it gets squeezed. Am I right? You don't know if you're what really truly walking in the fruit of the Spirit, if it's bearing in your life until there is a time of testing. There is a time of purging. And so what we do is we reduce the wilderness experience to understanding of tests because that's all we know. That's a, in a lot of it, it's just some biblical perspectives, and we just reduce it to a time of test. But there's much more to the wilderness than just testing, because I believe that studying this subject in full uh, in, in, in its entirety, which I've done, I believe there's much more about wilderness experience that meets the eye, because there's something else that God wants to teach us here. And so what I did is I, in, the, in terms of wilderness I want you to see some several meanings. It has several meanings, but I broke it down to three things that I believe that can mean and make it just as concise as I can. If you'll put those up on the screen, if you have an insert in your bulletin, you can write these down. Number one, it can mean divine discipline and development. That makes sense because that's biblical. In fact, Matthew chapter four, verse one, the first part of that chapter even is, is biblical. It says, then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the, of the devil. Look that. Did you see that? Did you notice what it said? He was led up of the spirit where into the wilderness. So divine discipline and development. There's a reason it's God leading there. Now, number two, it can also mean it is a personal escape and rejuvenation. I mean, this time of year, I was sharing with a, a friend, uh, we're doing some business, and I was sharing with some friend, and I say, listen, this time of year is, because we, were, we hadn't been able to get on the same page and, and care, you know, get together and make some uh, decisions, and I was like, you know, this time of year is a very busy time of year for me. It always is a very, very busy time, and, uh, but personal escape and rejuvenation is, a, is, another, is another insight for your wilderness experience. It may not just be that you're being tested. You may need to just get out into perhaps the deer woods just to enjoy some time alone and let God speak to you. Rejuvenation as well. So Psalms 18 and verse 33 I made reference to this book, Hind Feet and High Places, uh, and several places, I believe three or four places in the Bible, it talks about this. It says, He maketh my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon my high places. So it's not just written in the, in the vision of Psalms, but it's in other places in the Bible as well. Basically, that means like deer. It makes me uh, into a place where I am, I am free to roam and to, uh, on an excursion and to find myself and discovery and so many things that we could talk about there. And then number three is this one. And this number three is, is very important for us to, to, to take note of. It can mean full abandonment. Full abandonment. Wilderness experience, a time of abandonment. It's not good for a man to be alone. And uh, the uh, Proverbs even talks about isolation and being alone. If you're alone way too long. Uh, but if you'll notice what happened, the Gadarene man who was possessed by legion, the Bible says he was driven in the wilderness by the devil. Look at Luke 8.29. Put that up there if you will, guys. It says, for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man for oftentimes, here it is, he had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and break the bands. And look what it says. And was driven of the devil into the wilderness. Driven of the devil into the wilderness. So what we have already learned this morning, we have biblical instances where the Spirit of God leads 
Jesus in the wilderness. And now we have just read the devil drives a Gadarene to the wilderness, both to a place that God has created. Now, obviously, wilderness doesn't always mean a forest. It can also mean desert places. It can mean dry places. And so that's where Jesus was at. He wasn't in necessarily a place where there was a lot of trees. I have a friend from Houston, and he's overseas right now in, in the Holy Land, and he's been sharing pictures, Alex Medina, and he has been sharing a lot of pictures. And I'm like, man, I love it, I love it, I love it. But it is not, it's not what you think when you look at the wilderness of Judea. It's not a bunch of trees. You're seeing desert places, rocks and sand and other things there. And so my point is this. My point is the wilderness may, a, but may become a safe heaven, heaven, a safe haven from one type of danger, but then it also may become inhospitable too. It may be a safe haven for you at a season in your life to get you from the urbanization, from the culture that is maybe pulling you down and, and have you so busy that you can't even think straight. Or it also can be a place where it's, it, you can't live there. It's inhospitable. It is a place that you cannot survive. Only through the grace of God will you ever make it through it. And so I want you to think of that spiritually. So when you look at the Hebrews, the Hebrew children were wandering in a wilderness and they had an incredible int intimacy with God. Think of this. As soon as they're, they're, they're being delivered from Egypt and they, God miraculously uh, brings them across the Red Sea, they are immediately in what is called as the wilderness. Okay, they're here in the, in the Sinai uh, Peninsula, and they're over in this area, uh, we would call it uh, Saudi Arabia, and they're, they're, I mean, they're off in this desert place, but yet they're having intimacy with God. God is near to them. I mean, God is providing for them. I mean, they're striking a rock, and water's coming out of a rock. I mean, God is he's, he's raining quail, you know, feeding them on purpose, and he's He's leading them by a cloud during the day. The Shekinah cloud is guiding them. And then at night there's a fire. He's leading them. And it's, it's amazing that they're having an intimacy with God. Yet, we also read, as they're in having this intimacy with God, they also give in to temptations. The children, these Hebrew children, the children of Israel, they give in to temptations. They give in to insecurity. And they have doubt. So all of these things are present even though they're having intimate time. Does that not look like some of us today, to be honest, be transparent? That maybe we are close to God at times in our life and we just feel so close that we can hear his heartbeat and oh yeah, everything is going great. But then next thing you know, you have doubt. You're wrestling with doubt. God, is, is that really you? Did you spoke to me about my finances? Or maybe you're insecure about something or maybe tempted and you're going through this and you're going through all these things and yet you just had intimacy with God. It's not that God is, you know, we're up one day down, we're not bipolar by any means because God is the same, isn't he? That's wilderness, this wilderness experience. It's the thing that I, I really believe because I think everyone in this room, the wilderness may not be your first choice. Now, some of you, I mean, you may be Grizzly Adams. I mean, that may be your dream. And you, and you want to live out in the wilderness. And you want to find some acreage somewhere out in Yellowstone. And you just want to live. I mean, it's beautiful out there. I've been out there a, a few times. And, and I can see why people just love it. I mean, you can only handle so much of that until you have to come back into town and, or get groceries. Unless you are Grizzly Adams. And then you can live off the land. But maybe the wilderness is not your first choice. Maybe some of you are thinking, hey, man, I want some, at least some urbanization. I mean, at least go somewhere into a town where the stores are open past 9 o'clock at night, right? Don't have anybody know what I'm talking about. You know, it may not be your first choice, but I will say this. We ask this question, what is it about the wilderness that God favors? What is it that, that leads Jesus to the wilderness. What is it that God favors about the wilderness? That he leads. He, the Hebrews are escaped from this season of bondage, but they're now into a place of, of a wilderness journey in their life. What is it that God favors about it? This is what I believe. I believe God favors the wilderness because in that wilderness experience, God reveals his love and care for you. 
Because if you're just totally on the mountaintop at all times, or if you're just in the urbanization of, of life, and there's everything is to the, I mean, convenient for you, then you're not going to have to rely on God. You're not going to have to have faith anymore. You know, that's the difference between our nation and the continent of Africa. And people say, well, I mean, there's so many miracles that are happening in, in Africa. And why aren't we seeing it here? Because in Africa, you cannot just go to the, you know, convenience store or pharmacist and get what you need. You have to have faith to believe that God will heal you. I mean, God is not dead. And I've seen miracles, and I shared a miracle that took place, I uh, believe it, in South Africa. And a friend of mine shared that, a missionary friend of mine shared that. And here, I mean, God takes a lady's arm and before the camera and straightens it out. And only God can do something like that. Just think of all the things he could do if we truly had faith. Well, God guides us into the wilderness only to get us out of the wilderness. He guides us into the wilderness. You're in the wilderness, but you're not going to stay in the wilderness. He has a purpose for you out of the wilderness. He guides you in the wilderness to get you out of the wilderness. And so uh, before he does, I believe there needs to be some clear understanding of what we are transitioning out of. Why am I leaving the wilderness? What is it that I'm leaving here? Because if we don't have a clear understanding of what we're leaving, we won't have a full appreciation of what God is doing. And that's the seasons of life. And some of you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if, and if this morning, if God leads us back to another wilderness season, then we'll have a better understanding of why we are going into the wilderness. What is it that God is perfecting in my life? Because see, God, when he does things, he does things on purpose. On purpose. The primary purpose of the wilderness is to grow. That's why we have wilderness experiences, is to grow. See, the, the maturation process causes us to grow. But, you know, it can be a stressful time. <laughs> I was thinking about this early this morning. I got up and was praying. I was thinking about this thought. You know, people use the cliche, I'm too blessed to be stressed. You know, that is completely wrong. I know we like to say it, and then it sounds cool because it rhymes. But that really, the theology behind that is wrong. Because stress induces uh, uh, faith in God. Stress induces growth. If you never go through any time, any seasons of stress or frustration, if you never go in, and if, if, if there's, I know there's welders out here, and you've welded before, and, and part of you getting your, uh, even your uh, certification to weld, they do stress tests. And I know some of you have worked in pipeline industry, and uh, you've messed with things, and they do stress tests. And I remember certain things that I had to work on, and you always did a stress test to see if it would hold up to the pressure. And that's what God is saying to you and I this morning. We need enough God and experience and growth in our life that we're able to hold up to the pressure that we face. And so stress can be a good thing because I believe that the stress, stress is to induce the truth of who we are in Christ. You never know what kind of fruit you have until you're squeezed, right? And so what does stress do? Stress, <laughs> oh, you're looking holy now. Stress induces truth. And if it's little things, <laughs> I'm laughing at myself today because I had went through two of them already. I'm thinking, Holy Spirit, wow. If, if uh, you're going through little, if little things upset you, and get you agitated. <laughs> I don't know if I can keep preaching or not. And get you so frustrated and agitated and angry, then you need to go. It, you, it, the truth is being revealed about who you are and where you are right now. So I never eat on, I, I'll share with you. I never eat breakfast on Sunday morning, okay? Some of you, how, how many like breakfast food? That breakfast food is one of my favorites. I mean, I love, anytime we go over to Perkins, I usually get breakfast food. We don't go there much, but that's why I love breakfast food, love cooking breakfast. And so this morning I was like, 
I got up. I was early. I was up early, early praying. And after I got done praying, I said, you know what? I've got plenty of time. Everything's caught up here. I just, you know, I think I'm going to cook some, some eggs, just a couple, and uh, fry a, past, a sausage patty and, you know, just have some coffee with it. Because that is, I mean, one of the favorite things you can do. And, and so I open up the refrigerator and my wife comes in and she's, she's up praying and she says, oh, we don't have any eggs. <laughs> and I knew she said yesterday when I came back from hunting that she was getting eggs. And I thought, oh, no. And so, yeah, that's what she says. She comes up with some excuse all the time. Stretch, stretch your hands toward her. Let's pray. That's all right. That's all good. That's all good. So I was thinking, you know, and I could have just, oh, I felt inside. Have you ever been there? You just wanted to just say something. And, and I was very kind and I was very nice. Well, then, yes, I was. You, let God be the judge. Okay, God, I'm going to ask God. God. It's funny because I was praying the other day in that song, uh, Oh, Come to the Altar. You know, I was praying the other day, and, it, you know, Jesus calling, then my phone rang. And I said, oh, hey, that must be Jesus. So uh, <laughs> uh, I'm losing train of thought here because uh, I got a little distracted. And so this morning when I came in to, and I'm telling you, when things done in order, that's just who I am, and I open up the back, and the tr both of the trombones come falling out of the back of the car. And underneath the trombones is this suit coat in a mud puddle. And then, yeah, like I said, stress has a way of inducing truth. And I know all of you are looking holy, but in a few moments I'm going to give you the mic and you can tell on yourself. All right? So, you know, where God guides, he provides. How many believe that to be true? So here's my life point. The wilderness is where God does some of his best work. The wilderness is where God does some of his best work. Think about that. In the molding phase, the season that we find ourselves in, this is him doing his best work. Isaiah 43 and verse 19 said, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Think about this way in the wilderness. And so the wilderness is where God does some of his best work. So let's look quickly this morning, and then we're going to uh, send you away. Number one, let's look, at, let's look at four insights we can get out of the wilderness. And I'm going to go through these pretty quick. Number one, this is some insight that we can learn. Make, made room for God to speak clearly. You're in that wilderness time because, see, the urbanization of life right now has been all voices. The sounds of traffic, the sounds of the phone ringing, all the things everybody's talking uh, Job, everything's going on, school, whatever it may be, you're hearing all these voices, but in the wilderness, you discovered this insight. When you were there, it made room for God to speak clearly. It's beautiful out there in the wilderness because you can hear the voice of God. You know, Abraham, think of Abraham and Moses. These are great examples. Think of King David. I mean, he's not far, but he's in the wilderness and he's writing love songs to God. God's speaking to him. These are great examples of, of hearing the voice of God clearly at a time when they were in the wilderness. Moses standing before the burning bush and God speaking to him. He was in the wilderness. I mean, Abraham. And, he's, and it's not the lights from the city that is, that, is, uh, that is so, you know, illuminating his mind. But it's the stars. God says, look up. And if you can count those, that's the seed. It's the promise. He hadn't even had a child yet. Number two, increased our trust in God. It's another insight. Because I, I found in you, we have found an increase. It's helped me to trust. It's helped you to trust God in a greater way. And when Jesus was in the wilderness, he, was solely, he solely relied on God. Do you know that? 40 days, 40 nights in the wilderness, a time of testing, and he is completely relying on God. He's not calling like Elijah, calling to the ravens to come and feed him, is he? He's not calling for rain to come down from heaven. I mean, the quail is not coming and feeding him. He is completely relying on God. And look what he says in this time of test, Matthew 4, verse 3. It says, and when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be bread. And this is what Jesus answered. He said, it is written. In other words, God says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. 
the word of God. He completely, solely relied on God. Number three is this. Receive revelatory truth of who God is. When I'm in the wilderness, when you're in the wilderness, God becomes visible to us because no longer are our eyes fixed upon all the problems and all the things that's going on. Our eyes are upon him. The prophet Isaiah found himself in a personal wilderness. Did you know that? The death of his friend, Isaiah, his king. And during that death, during that time of mourning, Isaiah has a experience with God. Isaiah has an encounter with God, a truth encounter. Look at Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Look at that. And it says, Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, and twain he covered his face, face and with twain he covered his feet, and, and with twain he did fly. And one cried. Look what it says. Now he's seen God, and one cried in another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And what a beautiful, beautiful invitation of God. And look, it says, and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, this seraphim that's crying, holy, 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 that the whole structure is moving and the house was filled with smoke. The presence of God. That what they would call, I heard it called Shekinah, Shekinah, the glory of God. Think about that. Even in your wilderness journey, in that peregrination of your life, you can sense or see and experience the glory of God. So he received revelatory truth of who God is. All the facets of God. How amazing and wonderful he is. Maybe you're here this morning and maybe God is saying, I want to reveal myself to you in a deeper way. And so I'm, I have you in this wilderness for this reason. To reveal myself to you. But also the last one, number four, is this. Receive revelatory truth of who you are. Like we've been saying, you get a better grip, grip on your identity of who you really are. So because if you look at Isaiah, not only did Isaiah have this revelation of who God is, but what else happened? You've heard me say it before. He had an immediate revelation of who he had become. And when you are in the presence of God, when you're having this kind of encounter, this kind of truth encounter with God, immediately God will reveal to you who you are. You will see yourself. And how does he see himself? We'll look at Isaiah, continue in chapter 6. Look at the next verse, verse 5. He said, then said, I woe. In other words, we would say, oh, Lord, or Lord have mercy. Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Look what it says in verse 6. It says, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having the, a live coal in his hand. Now remember, even the voice of this seraphim is that has the ability to shake things. And he's coming near to him. And he takes the coal, and it says, which had taken it from the tongs from off the altar. And he said, He laid it upon my mouth. Because that's the first thing he began to look at was his ugly. It doesn't necessarily mean that he was, uh, he was uh, you know, mendacious. He wasn't telling the truth. He didn't say that. It's not specific. It's not saying that he was a one that had a uh, problem with profanity. He's not saying any of that. It's not direct. But he is recognizing that his lips are unclean. And he laid it upon the mouth, and lo, he has touched thy lips. And look here. It says, thy iniquity is taken away. And thy sin purged. And so when you're in the wilderness, there will be times of purging. And it doesn't feel good. I know. But it's there. God is, remember, he sent you into the wilderness to get you out of the wilderness. And also he heard the voice of the Lord saying, and this is where I want to really get to drive this point home this morning. He says, whom shall I send and whom will go for us? And what did Isaiah immediately say? With those lips that have been purged, with the iniquity that has been forgiven, Isaiah says, I, said I, he says, here am I, send me. What does that mean? Well, see, God wasn't going to send Isaiah until Isaiah was ready to go. But he had to be in this 
time of testing and purging before he was ready to go. And you know what I see, Brother Vernon, there's a lot of people who says, hey, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, but they're not ready. And so God says, okay, if that's truly where you want to go, then I'm going to take you through a time, a season of testing. I'm going to take you through the wilderness. Well, well that, that brings me to this next question. Have you ever wondered, where was God wanting Isaiah to go? Where was it? Where was the prophet Isaiah? I mean, he just had this great, beautiful revelation of God and the temple and all the things that were there. But where was God wanting Isaiah to go? God was sending Isaiah out of the wilderness and back to urbanization, back to reality, back to his everyday, sometimes mundane lifestyle. Back to American greetings. Back to the post office. Back to Gosnell School. I heard, I heard a mm when I said post office. Back to, back to, you know, Rivercrest. Back to New Corps. Back to reality. Back to life. That's where God was sending us Isaiah. Oh, sure, it would be great to be caught up with God always, constantly with him and, and walking with God. I mean, and then you say Abraham was a friend of God and didn't uh, Adam walk with God in the cold of day? I mean, don't you want that kind of relationship? You can have that kind of relationship inside or outside of the wilderness. See, when you're leaving the wilderness, you're heading back to the initial call and divine purpose of your life when you're out of the wilderness. John the Baptist was described as the prophet who was a voice. And then look what it says. He's crying. So you have to see voices even in the wilderness need to be heard out into the everyday life. So as Pastor Crystal comes this morning, I want to ask you this. How do I apply this to my life? So what now what? How do I go from auditing this message, everything that I've heard about this out of the wilderness message, how can I make application to this? Remember what it said in Isaiah 50, or 43 and 19, it said, behold, I will do a new thing. I heard the Holy Spirit say that to some people in this room. Let me just share something with you. I've got a little bit of time. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I had back in the early part of, of the summer, it was like toward, it was in the month of May. And I told some people about this. I had, I had a, uh, something that God was dealing with me about. And this is really unique the way this, this happened. And I said to, I said to God, I even told my wife, I said, you know what? I want to, I want to fall in love with Jesus more. Truly fall in love with Jesus. I really want to see Jesus. I just don't want to, you know, here I am a pastor and I'm studying quite a bit throughout the week and I'm getting all this information and, and yet I have, a, I have a hunger and a desire to know Christ in a deeper way. And I said, I, I really want to know Jesus more. And I began to read the works of Jesus. I began to read other books that kind of outlined his life and I had some help along the way. And all that was good. But when I, and I didn't know this was going to happen, but when I took a missions trip, I met some people and I continued to see Jesus in them. And then when I got back home, God be began to talk to me about that. He said, I showed you Jesus. I showed you my son in the lives of people that you've met. I even told my wife, I said, I'm gonna, I feel like God has connected me with something, with some people, and I believe there's a purpose. And then uh, I was visiting Brother G before I had left. Uh, we had just returned from Washington, D.C., and I visited with Brother Gene, and he gave me a word, and he said, God is gonna connect you with people, and these are e eternal connections. And then God just revealed himself to me through others, and I thought, man, that is so beautiful. But can we be 
that type of influence to others? Because see, somebody may be needing to see Jesus in your life. And you've heard him say, well, maybe the Bible is the only, you're the only Bible that someone reads. You've heard that said many times before. And when I look at this new thing, maybe it's not so materialistic as we were saying last week. Maybe there's some true intrinsic value in this newness that God is wanting to spring upon us. And he says this. He says, I will even make a way in the wilderness. And we, in our mind, we think, well, he's going to provide money in my time of testing. And we always isolate it to some we gravitate toward some materialistic value, something tangible, something that we got to hold and touch. And maybe that's not ex all that he's saying. And maybe he's saying the way that I'm making is, is Jesus because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And maybe the way of the wilderness is that he is molding and shaping you to become so much like Christ. That you can be that hidden manna that Revelation speaks of. You can be that fountain, that water. Of, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Be that living water somebody needs. Because see, he says, way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. See, the wilderness is where God does some of his best work. And as you come out of the wilderness, you come out a better person, stronger person, a faithful person. As much as we might prefer to avoid it, the wilderness is where God is at. The wilderness is where God does some of his best work. And I believe the best way to make true applications of the message is this. Don't despise your journey. Don't despise your journey, but enjoy your journey. Stand with me this morning. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, and this is Sister Charlotte and my, one of our favorite scriptures. It says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. The blessings are coming. It is coming. It's coming. Yes, it is coming. Your season of yes, your seasons of blessing, they're on the way. It's coming. Receive it this morning. Receive it this morning. He will make a way in the wilderness. He will make rivers in the desert. What if we all determine today, I'm just going to enjoy the journey. No breakfast this morning. Sounded good. But I'm going to enjoy the journey. Coat has a little mud and water on the back of it. Wherever it's at. I'm going to enjoy the journey. Things may just have not worked out like you thought they were going to work out. But I'm going to enjoy the journey. Some of you coming Thursday. The stress of Thanksgiving is going to induce the truth of who you are. I hope you realize that. You bring the turkey out of the oven and the mother-in-law says, well, that's just not all the way done. Or you, it's drier than the Sahara Desert. I know, either way, my advice to you is to remember this message. Remember this message. My grandma Brown would say, Green and Barrett. I would say to you, sweet potato pie and shut my mouth. Amen. Take your neighbor by the hand this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we are determined today. We're not going to despise this journey that we're in. But we're going to enjoy every step of the way. Every step becoming better for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody says, amen.